Let's admit it. Prayer can be awkward and uncomfortable sometimes. Heard a story about a man named Tony Campolo who was invited to speak on a campus one time, and before the campus chapel service, they, there was a group of men who invited him to come back into this back room, and they wanted to gather around and lay hands and pray, pray for him. And so he said he went back into this back room, and there's eight of them, and they asked him to kneel down in the center of the room, and then they all came around and put their hands on him. And if you've ever been in that position of, of having other people gathering around you to pray, you know that what happens, that only you know if you've experienced this, is that without even planning on it, people end up leaning into you and putting more and more weight on you as the time goes on. And they don't even realize, but meanwhile, you're just feeling the weight of all that pressure as they're leaning on you. And he said, in particular, this group was a Pentecostal group. So they, they were like competing for how long their prayers were going to be. And they had sweaty hands. And so the, these heavy, sweaty hands are leaning on him. And just the longer the prayers are going on, he's feeling the weight. And one of the, one of the pastors whispered in his ear, do you feel that? Do you feel the spirit? And he said, I don't think it's the spirit I feel. I think it's... <laughs> The sweat from your palm pressing down on me. And as weight is coming down, he says, they're just praying and praying, each one of them taking time to pray. And eventually, he says, one of the guys in that group uh, started praying off topic, something that had nothing to do with what was going on. And he's praying for Charlie Stolzfus. Lord, you know how Charlie Stolzfus left his wife and kids this morning. And you know that, that family and that precious family. Lord, I pray that you'll send somebody into their life to, to bring that family back together. And he's thinking to himself, if you're going to lean on me with half of your body weight, at least you could pray for me, not some other random guy. And he kept, keeps going, Lord, you know how that family, that precious family lives in that trailer, the silver trailer, about a half a mile up the road, down here from the left, right where the road ends. And he's thinking, does the Holy Spirit need GPS coordinates to know how to intercede for this guy? And he keeps going, and then finally he stops, somebody else keeps praying, and finally they released him from his captivity. But prayer can be awkward that way. Prayer can be uncomfortable sometimes that way. I heard the Christian comedian Tim Hawkins talk one time about how in some churches and in some Christian circles, Christians like to gather up and hold hands to pray. If you've been part of one of these groups, when I grew up in a church where sometimes we'd encircle the sanctuary and hold hands and, and this would be happening, and there's two groups of people, those who make us do it and the rest of us. And he said, whenever a church does that, whenever you're in a group where they cuddle up and hold hands and start praying, you can look around the group and there's somebody who's saying, where is that guy that I saw didn't wash his hands coming out of the bathroom? Where is he? And, but he said, especially what happens is you get in that group and you're holding hands and as soon as everybody says amen, you can hear it. You can almost hear it. Where everybody goes, amen, squeeze. Amen, squeeze. You know what I'm talking about. You've been a part of that group, and you've done it. Most of you have probably even done it. You get to the end of that prayer time, and there's that little squeeze at the end, and what the signal is with the squeeze, he says, is we're done. You can let go now. <laughs> please, like, please give me my hand back. And if you look around at the end of that, you can also see somebody going like this, wiping all the <laughs> stuff off their hands. Prayer can be awkward and uncomfortable. And we're in a series right now on prayer, and I feel like my spiritual gift is being awkward and uncomfortable. And so I feel particularly qualified. Why are their heads nodding at that? That's, that's hurtful. Uh, I feel like my spiritual gift is awkwardness and uncomfortableness. So I feel particularly qualified to talk about this today. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 18, which is a passage where Abraham goes before the Lord and intercedes in a way that is full weight, body weight leaned into God, sweaty palms, putting all of his weight into this as he's praying an awkward and uncomfortable prayer before the Lord. My name is Steve Dunmire. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met before, I want to say good morning to our Elmira campus. Good morning to everybody joining us online. And in particular, we got a prayer request a couple weeks ago from somebody who watches us online every week from Arizona. And at the end of this, this prayer request, he said, P.S., tell Pastor Dunmire we're rooting for his bills. So, Don, we're praying for you out in Arizona. Go Bills, and uh, really glad you're here with us this morning. And before we jump into Genesis 18, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word. And today, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we pray in your name. Amen. So Genesis 18, here's what it says. Then the Lord said... Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So the Lord is wrestling. Something's about to happen. Should I tell Abraham in advance? And then the Lord decides to do that. Verse 20 then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great 
and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if, they have done, if, if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. And then the men turned away and went to Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. This is a really powerful moment. This heavy weight has just been dropped, and Abraham remains, remains standing before the Lord after receiving this news. A couple of things for context here, some backdrop. Where in the world is Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, spoiler alert, Sodom and Gomorrah no longer exists, but we believe by the best evidence that it may be on the shores of the Dead Sea, someplace like that, somewhere in that vicinity, but, but right now it, it hasn't existed for a long, long time, and so we don't know for sure exactly where it was. So where is Gomorrah, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Secondly, uh, what, what is wrong here? This is a painting from a French artist. Uh, named Jules Lorenz, who, who depicts the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what exactly they did, what exactly the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is, is not explicitly said here in Genesis 18. It is stated that this is rampant. It's blatant sin. It's out in the open. It's out in the, in the obvious for everyone to see. And it's, it, the stench of this sin is rising before the nose of the Lord. It's not, it's not saying here that people have been crying out to the Lord about Sodom and Gomorrah but that their actions, the, the, the smell of their sin has risen before the Lord and he has to go down and check it out for himself. Now, there is, there's a lot that's involved here. And part of this surely is the sexual nature of the sin. And, and, and we know from the, the teachings of Scripture that God's plan for human sexuality are marriage between one man and one woman for keeps or celibacy. And that this has overflowed the banks of what God's plan is for human sexuality. But it goes way beyond that. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of wickedness. And it's, it's a perverse and thoroughly corrupt a sit, pair of cities that the stench of that has risen before the Lord. So, who is Gomorrah? Why, or where is Gomorrah? I'll do you one better. Why is Gomorrah? And the real reason why this is here, Genesis chapter 18 in particular, is not so much asking the question about what they did wrong, but why is the Lord talking to Abraham about this? It's peculiar that the, that the verses we read started with him saying, should I share with Abraham what I'm about to do? And it seems as though the Lord is bringing this plan, bringing the concern on the Lord's heart before Abraham to say, what are you going to say about it, Abraham? What should we do next about this? And inviting Abraham even into a conversation about what's supposed to happen. It's, what's really interesting to me about this, I love the way John Orberg says this. He says, why is it that the Psalms are so full of human anger that they express, express so much raw, unfiltered hostility and lust for vengeance and fury and demands for divine justice to come pretty quickly, and that the prayers prayed in churches feel so, well, decaffeinated. Abraham is not about to pray a decaffeinated prayer. He's about to pray a high-octane, full-body weight leaning into this sweaty palm Pentecostal kind of prayer, leaning into the Lord, interceding for what's about to happen. And this is what he says, verse 23, Then Abraham, who's there standing before the Lord, said, Will you sweep away the righteous and the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all earth do right? This is not a decaffeinated prayer. This is a high-octane, full-body weight-leaning-in kind of prayer. And what he's essentially asking the Lord to do is to change the world to change things, to intercede, and to do something different than what's already happening, which is really what we always do in prayer, right? Most of our prayers are asking God to take the world as it is and to change it, to shift it, to change the circumstances we're living in. And that's what he's asking God to do. And the question is, do we ever actually expect God to do that? It's a story from Dr. Cornelius Plantinga who talks about a seminary student who went to pray with uh, an older woman in his church and he said, as they were visiting together, she, she said, you know, most of my family, his family and friends have passed away. I've, I love the Lord. I've loved and served the Lord my whole life. And I'm just worn out. I don't know why the Lord hasn't called me home yet. And as they were talking this over, he said, have you told the Lord that? You're, you're obviously ready to go to be with the Lord. You've served him. You're at peace with Jesus. Are, are you, you're ready to go home. Have you said that out loud to Jesus? And she said, no, I guess I haven't. He said, would you like to now? So she said, yeah, sure. So they, he took her hands and he prayed with her. Lord, you know, Sister Tiffany has loved you her whole life and she's served you faithfully and she's at peace with you. She loves you and she's tired and she's ready to go home. So Lord, would you call her home 
uh, here soon so she could be at peace with you and no longer be, uh, be suffering and struggling. And when he said amen, he opened his eyes and she had passed. And he was horrified. <laughs> Dr. Planningus says about that, he said he hadn't meant it to come to that. He hadn't expected God to act. It was only a prayer. He was so horrified, he didn't tell anybody for three years about that prayer. He felt guilty that he had prayed this prayer with her and God actually did it. And so often we pray and we think, we're asking God to do mighty things, but would we be shocked and mortified? Would, be, would we be horrified if we saw God do what he actually says he's, what we're asking him to do? There's been a lot of studies looking into this, actually, and there was a really famous study done by Harvard University. They spent $2.4 million and looked at this over 10 years to see if there was any difference for people who were prayed for versus those who are not. And they looked at a variety of patients. If you're into research, this is a a double-blind study and peer-reviewed, and they had people who were being prayed for who didn't know they were being prayed for and people who were not being prayed for who didn't know anything about the whole thing. And they, over 10 years, $2.4 million, they investigated this. It's called the Harvard Step Prayer Study, in case you're wondering. And what they found was that there was no difference. Those who were prayed for fared no better than those who were not prayed for. And it made a lot of waves. When, when Harvard spends $2.4 million on something and it produces those kinds of results, people were, were nervous. What does this mean? What do we do with that? There's some people who looked at that study and they said, wait a minute, who did you have praying? And so they did a second study. This was published by the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1998. And this time they had people who had orthodox traditional Christian beliefs, salvation through Christ, belief in in, uh, the the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, belief that, that you need to be born again, and people who testified to an experience of being born again, And they had them praying this time. And this time, over a 12-month period, they had 990 consecutive coronary care patients admitted to one particular hospital. I think it was in Kansas City. And they had these patients prayed for. And so people never knew that they were being prayed for. And the people who were praying only got the first name of the person they were praying for. And over a 12-month period, this time they found, this is the results, quote, we found that intercessory prayer produced a measurable improvement in the medical outcomes of critically ill patients. Dallas Willard said about 10, 15 years ago that there's been over 130 studies published in medical journals and other scholarly journals and professional journals establishing the fact that when God's people pray, something happens. It's measurable. It's observable. We can see the difference that it makes. In fact, even in the Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine, they looked at people who were suffering from anxiety and depression, and they had each of them go through, uh, some of this group, go through a a six-week intervention of a prayer meeting every week for one hour for six weeks. And they said at the end of those six weeks, those who received prayer, they didn't even lay hands, they didn't even shake hands when they walked in, they just prayed for them for an hour every week for six weeks. They said at the end of those six weeks, those who were prayed for had a measurable difference in their anxiety and depression levels versus those who were not prayed for. Now listen, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying if you're depressed or anxious, just pray it away or that you don't have enough faith. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that God, it's a measurable, objective fact that God responds to our prayers. That God is moving and and answering our prayers in a way that even the scientific and the medical community has been able to verify by fact. Tim Keller says it beautifully. He says, he allows the world to be susceptible to our prayers. How he does this, how he maintains control over history, and yet still makes human prayer and actions responsible within history, is one of the most practical mysteries of the Bible. It's amazing. I don't know how he does it, that God is sovereign over the world, that he is God Almighty, and yet somehow he allows our prayers to redirect how things are going to go. That somehow he allows our action and our prayers to change the course of history in ways that is measurable and objective. And the, but the problem is often not that we don't ask enough, but that we don't ask. The problem isn't that, that God doesn't move, but that we never take the time to ask. And watch what Abraham asks in verse 26. The Lord said, okay, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Verse 27, and Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold, remember how bold he was, truly challenging the Lord. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy destroy the whole city for lack of five people? Saying basically, you're saying you'll spare the city for, for 50 people. If they're just a couple people short, you're going to still destroy the city? And the Lord says, well, if I find 45 there, I will not destroy it. 
Once again, Abraham spoke to him. What if it's only 40 people who are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. And then verse 30, then he said again, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? In the next few verses, he continues to haggle God down from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. Finally, he gets God down to 10, that if there's even 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah God will spare the city. And it seems like, like Abraham is haggling with God, like he's on a market in a city street trying to negotiate the price and trying, or trying to buy a used car and trying to haggle down the price. But what he's doing is he's interceding. He's standing in the gap for this place for this city that is so far gone, for this place that is so destitute. He's standing in the gap and interceding on their behalf before the Lord. Abraham heard what was about to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah. He heard the state of things in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he put himself between him and the Lord. He stood in the gap, stood before the Lord, and he stood in the gap and interceded on behalf of these people. In Exodus chapter 22, it says that the Lord was with Moses on, the, on Mount Sinai, and as Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai, they see that the people have taken off their earrings and their watches and their rings and their jewelry, and they fashioned a golden calf. And not only have they fashioned a golden calf, but they're dancing around it and singing and worshiping this golden calf. And Moses sees what's happened. He sees how sad this is. He sees how far gone they are. And he stands in the gap between the people and God and says, show them mercy, show them grace. Do not take out them for their sin. Show them grace in this moment. And there in that moment, Moses stands in the gap. In Ezekiel chapter 22, it says that the Lord looks out over the land and he's looking for an Abraham. He's looking for a Moses. He's looking for someone who will stand in the gap. And it says he found no one. And the question today is, who will stand in the gap? There are children who are impoverished and neglected and are suffering and don't have anyone who speak value into them, don't have anyone to care for them, and who will stand in the gap for them? There are marriages that are falling apart, marriages that are drifting apart, marriages that are fractured, fractured and families that are falling apart. Who will intercede for them? Who will stand in the gap for them? There are so many problems in our nation. Our nation is sick. There are people who don't know their right hand from their left. There are people who are celebrating what is evil and calling what is good bad. And there's so much suffering. And you can watch 24-7 cable news coverage about this. You can doom scroll for the rest of the day. I'm not asking you today if you want to find out more of what's wrong with our nation, what's wrong with our world. I'm asking you, who will be an intercessor? Who will stand in the gap? As the Lord himself said in 2 Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their, heal their land. So who will stand in the gap? John Wesley said, God does nothing except an answer to prayer. So where are the prayers at? E.M. Bounds says, only God can move mountains, but faith and prayer move God. So who wants to get on their knees and move God's heart through prayer and intercession, standing in the gap for a lost and hurting world? Eugene Peterson says, praying is a courageous act. So who among us has the courage to pray and to seek God's face and to stand in the gap on, on behalf of others who are in need? Walter Wink says, history belongs to the intercessors. So who wants to help shape history together? Where are the intercessors? I asked you a few months ago, if God asked, answered every prayer that you prayed in the last week, what would be different in the world? If God answered every prayer that you prayed in the last week, whose life would be different? How would our community be different? How would your life be different? And who outside of yourself would have a better off life because of the prayers you prayed this week? Because the evidence is clear through Scripture and God's promises and through even observable, objective facts from the medical community and the scientific community that God moves in response to his people's prayers. And the problem is, we never ask. So where are the intercessors? This is how we fight our battles. This is how we wage war in the heavenlies, by getting on our knees and praying awkward, uncomfortable, sweaty hands, leaning in with all of our body weight kind of prayers. And this is how the verse ends, verse 33. It says, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left. And Abraham returned home. History belongs to the intercessors. And Abraham has stood in the gap and interceded on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. But as it turns out, there weren't 50 righteous. There weren't 45 righteous. There weren't 40 or 30 or 20 or even 10. Only Lot and his family. And they were spared. And some of us think that Lot and his family were spared because 
Abraham stood in the gap and pleaded on behalf of the righteous and the wicked of Sodom and Gomorrah. So today, I want to invite you to stand in the gap, to think about who it is that you can stand in the gap for, who it is in your life and in your sphere of influence that you can stand in the gap for. And first, I want to invite you to stand in the gap for someone who needs healing. And to think right now, maybe there's a name or a face that comes to mind of someone who you know there's a diagnosis, there's some way that they're suffering, and, uh, and to pray for healing. God has done it, and we believe he can do it again. And in a moment, we're going to take time and invite you to pray for that person. Second, I want to invite you to pray for someone who's in need. Maybe someone who's lost a job. Maybe someone who's struggling to make ends meet. Uh, maybe somebody who's had some unexpected expenses, medical bills or, or car payments or car bills and things that they're struggling to cover the payments for. And to think of that person or think of that family and pray that God will provide for them uh, more than they could possibly ask or imagine. Third, for someone who needs the Lord. You may know someone who is far from the Lord or they used to walk with the Lord and they've walked away and to, to lift them up before the Lord. Lord, I know this person is far from you and I'm asking you to intercede in their, on their behalf to, to draw them to you, to put believers in their path and maybe even me in their path to help share the hope that they can have in Christ. And lastly, to pray for some place, to stand in the gap for some place. That's what Abraham did, praying on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah for this particular place, for these particular cities. And to, to pray for the place where you are and to play, pray for the place where we are. I know of people at our Elmira campus who pray every week and every day for the city of Elmira, who've got a burden for that place and for that city, for God to move in the city of Elmira. And I would invite you to pray for, this, for, for Painted Post and Corning and the town you come from, wherever you may be, and to intercede for this place that God's Spirit will be poured out in a way of power and authority and to see what he might be able to do among us. So we're going to take a moment in a little bit to pray for people who need healing, for people who are in need, for someone who needs the Lord, and for some place, whatever that place might be in your mind. And prayer can be awkward. Prayer can be uncomfortable. That prayer, and Tony Campolo was in that back room, and those men were all praying with him and leaning in with all their weight and leaving their sweaty handprints all over his back. And that one man kept praying for Charlie Stolzfus, and he didn't know what in the world he was praying for Charlie Stolzfus for. He said when the chapel service was done, he got in his car to go home. Uh, he started driving up the road, and uh, not too far up the road, he saw a, a hitchhiker on the side of the road. Now listen, don't go hitchhiking. Don't pick up hitchhikers. It's a bad idea. That's not the point of telling the story. If you want to ride in a car with a stranger, you can pay somebody to do it now with Uber. So you can do it that way. But uh, don't pick up hitchhikers. Don't be a hitchhiker. And, uh, but he pulls over and rolls down his window and says, hey, where are you headed? And the guy tells him where he's headed. And he says, that's right on my way. Jump in. I can get you there. The guy gets in the car and they pull up back up on the road. And he says, by the way, my name's Tony. What's your name? And the guy says, my name is Charlie Stolzfus. He don't say so without saying anything, the next exit, he got off the exit and Charlie Stolzfus is in the passenger seat and he says, hey, where are we going? He said, I'm taking you home, Charlie. Taking me home? What do you mean you're taking me home? Why are you taking me home? He said, because you left your wife and three kids this morning. And Charlie Stolzfus' eyes got big as saucers and he plastered himself against the passenger side door and he's just looking at him and said, he didn't take his eyes off of me for the rest of that drive. And he drove around, and because of that prayer, because that guy had prayed such specific directions of where Charlie Stolzfus's silver trailer was a half mile up from that campus at the, at the end of the road, he knew exactly where to go, and he pulled up in front of that silver trailer. And as, if Charlie Stolzfus wasn't shocked enough by this point, he pulls up in front of that trailer, and he says, how in the world did you know where I live? And Tony looks at him and says, God told me. <laughs> and his wife came out the front door, and she was overwhelmed to see him coming, uh, coming back home. And she says, I can't believe you came back home. And Charlie goes out and he gives her a hug. And, and his back is to Tony as his wife's facing Tony. And he could see that, uh, Char uh, that Charlie was whispering something in her ears. And her eyes got big as saucers as she heard what had just happened. And then Tony got out of his car and he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go in and we're going to sit down on your couch and we're going to have a conversation. And he said that afternoon, he led that couple to the Lord. And not only that, but Charlie went on to become a preacher of the gospel and proclaimed the gospel for many years in the state of California. And it all began because someone had a burden. It all began because someone had a burden for that family 
someone had a burden and prayed a prayer that was awkward and uncomfortable and felt out of place, felt mis- inappropriate even in that particular moment, but someone had a burden and prayed that prayer and it brought that family back together. So let's go before the throne of grace. Let's stand in the gap this morning together and pray for people who are in, need healing and people who are in need and people who need the Lord and for some place that might be on your mind. Let's pray together. Lord, we would pray even if there was evidence that it didn't work because it's such a privilege to cast our cares before you. It is such a privilege to get to talk to you and to know that you're listening. But I pray right now that as we pray, as we go to prayer, that you'll move in power and quicken the faith of my brothers and sisters. That you'll embolden our faith and and prompt us to pray bolder prayers and to see you move among us. And so right now, Lord, we pray for somebody who needs healing. And their faces and names flash before our minds. And we whisper their names to you and pray that you'll bring healing. That you'll bring a dramatic reversal of what's going on and that you'll be glorified. Lord, we pray for people who are in need. It's people we know who've lost a job or lost income, have had unexpected expenses. We pray you'll provide for them that you'll prompt people around them to be generous and to help chip in and meet some of their needs. You'll provide unexpected income. Provide food and all the resources they need, we pray it in your name. Lord, we pray for someone who needs to know you, someone who's far from you, that you will pursue them, that they'll sense your overwhelming love for them. That you'll put people in their path and maybe even us in their path to share the hope that we have in Christ and that they'll soon and very soon come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for some place. Right now we pray for this particular place where our feet and our, our feet are resting and for the Painted Post and Corning community, we pray for the city of Elmira. And there are other places you put on our hearts and minds. Cities. States of New York and Pennsylvania. We pray for our nation. You'll pour out your spirit. And other places that you place on our hearts and minds, we pray for these places. Interceding on their behalf. Knowing that you're good. Lord, we trust you. We love your faithfulness to us. We're so grateful for it. Hear our cry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our time this morning by partaking of the Lord's Supper together. You may have received elements as you came in this morning. If you didn't get those, you've still got a chance. You can raise a hand and one of the ushers will bring it to you or you can slip out back quick. You've got a moment. Here at Victory, we practice open communion, which means you don't need to be a member of Victory or a member of the Wesleyan Church to participate. If your heart is to be with the Lord and if you've given your heart to Jesus, then it's your invitation that you receive from him to come and receive this morning. And so we're going to take a moment at Elmira. Brad is going to lead you through that in just a few moments. And here, uh, the team is going to lead us through part of a song, and then I'll come back up and lead us through the partaking of the elements. Let's take a moment and prepare our hearts before the Lord.